All right, we are recording. Okay, so we're gonna cover chapter nine. And um, chapter nine kind of starts off with this, um, this question, it's kind of like case study um, of whether gender affects promotions at a bank. And they're, they're kind of using this question to motivate the need for hypothesis testing. And they, they, they motivate the need for it by, by saying, well, look, like we can, we can plot the data um, and we can see that, you know, clearly um, males are promoted more than females at this bank, but um, there, there's an open question here about whether um, that's enough uh, to, to prove that there's bias. And so they, the way that they put it is, um, this is just a quote. Uh, they, they, they ask, does this provide, this being the, the little graph that we saw, conclusive evidence that there's gender discrimination in promotion at banks? Um, could a difference in promotion rates of 29.2% still occur by chance, um, even in a hypothetical world where no gender-based discrimination existed? So, so yeah, basically they're, the question, like another way of putting the question they're asking is like, could what we're observing here just be due to like sampling variation. And um, so that's kind of the problem that they, the, the kind of motivating problem for why we, we should care about hypothesis testing. And the next paragraph, they, they go into, um, they try and like elicit an intuition about like how you can do hypothesis testing. So first they ask us to um, imagine a world where there, is no bias based on the gender um, for, for promotion. And here's what they say about such a world. They say, in such a hypothetical universe, the gender of an applicant would have no bearing on their chances of promotion. Bringing things back to our promotions data frame, the gender variable would thus be an irrelevant label. Um, if these gender labels were irrelevant, then we could randomly reassign them by shuffling them to no consequence. So they, they give an example of what they mean by this. So they say, look, let's say you have, you know, six decisions um, and, you know, those decisions um, uh, have gender information. You could basically just reassign the gender to those decisions randomly. And that's what's shown under this shuffled gender um, column here. And um, if you, when you reassign that, uh, that gender, um, basically you, you, you can, um, because you can reassign that, that, sorry, you can reassign that gender because you're presupposing that there's no difference, that gender doesn't make a difference in the promotion decision. Um, and basically they're saying, okay, if you, do this shuffling lots of times, um, you're gonna wind up with a distribution of a difference in promotion rates. And that distribution is gonna look something like this. Um, so they, in the text, they, I think they only do it like once and then they do it like 10 times and then they do it like a thousand times. But um, the distribution and the difference of promotion rates um, looks, looks something like this. Um, where in the vast majority of cases, there actually is going to be no difference in promotion rates. Um, like that, that's going to be what the majority of our samples look like. Because again, we're just randomly assigning um, the gender here. And, but in some cases, there are going to be some differences. And this is just kind of the standard sampling variation um, that, we've, that we've talked about, um, you know, throughout, throughout the text and in particular in the last chapter. Um, and so, what they call this is um, it's a it's a hypothesis testing using a permutation test. So this kind of reshuffling um, is is uh, is basically looking at different permutations of the uh, of the gender, and that's why it's called a, a permutation test. Um, so um, now they, with, with that being said, they 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 kind of get into um, they want to get into some terminology and some definitions. 
So um, they give a definition for a hypothesis. Um, and I'm going to steal your format a little bit here. Like, what, what, um, can you give it like a kind of a definition of a hypothesis? Um, uh, yeah, I might. Understanding of hypothesis is it's a theory that you have, mm -hmm. an effect, and it has so it has like um, some kind of mechanism that is driving an effect, and there's a direction to it, and and that's uh, then your hypothesis. Okay. Yeah. What about? Can you put it in terms of um, like populations versus samples? Yeah, so like a hypothesis here would like if you use the population of employees at banks mm -hmm. and your hypothesis could be that there's discrimination for advancement against females. So that would be like your hypothesis. So you're saying of this overall population, um, females are discriminated against. So that's like a direction. And I think that'd be my yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that's basically what they say. It's a statement about the value of an unknown population parameter. Um, and so like, yeah, we don't know if there's discrimination in the population. We have a sample and we kind of have to, we have to um, make an inference from that. Okay, what about a, uh, a hypothesis test? What, how do they define that? And like, what are, what are kind of the two? The two yeah, so then their definition for hypothesis test is once you, once you have your um, your hypothesis and you have a direction, then uh, you compare that to. Uh, so you you have your you expect this effect. You're going to measure that effect against um, a um, benchmark, which in all most cases it's the null hypothesis where there's no effect on gender. Um, so then you get your distribution of uh, the null. The null distribution you compare it to what you observed from your sample, and that's the, the test. Is it significant? Does this effect fit in the null distribution, um, you know, to a large extent, or is it an outlier? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really good. Um, the, the the way that they put it is just like it's a test between two competing hypotheses: the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Um, so I think you you gave like a more detailed answer to the question. Um, which is great. Uh, okay, and you already mentioned the null distribution. Um, so what is the null distribution? Like we kind of, I kind of glossed over it um, in that example um, of the, the discrimination, but, but yeah, what's, how do they define it? So they define, I, I, I believe they put it in terms of it's, um, it's a simulation. Um, you're assuming that there is no, um, effect so your explanatory variable is not um, affecting the outcome so you can shuffle it right. and so by shuffling it a bunch of times you get a and then you sample that effect size you get a distribution of effects from that null um, distribution so yeah it's it's like a bunch of samples um, in that yeah yeah, yeah, I, that's yeah, that's it. I mean, it, they they say that it's it's the sampling distribution of the test statistic, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, um, and I, yeah, that's basically what you said. Uh, okay, um, another definition, last one, I think. Um, what what's a p value? So the p value is, well, effectively, it's like the um, it's one minus the percentile of wherever you're effect falls in the null distribution um, and it's the uh, but it's all they call it like but the alpha and it implies um, the, the likelihood that your data um, is is surprising um, yeah yeah well well said um, yeah is surprising assuming the null hypothesis is true so like yeah just as extreme like the probability that you would observe this or something even more extreme, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Um, so yeah, so they go over these definitions and then they kind of break down like how you would actually do hypothesis testing using infer. So, you know, they give us this, uh, this code for, for constructing the null distribution. And you can see that like, 
um, you know, we're saving the results here in this null distribution variable. Um, here, like this is similar to what we were doing um, in the last chapter where we were constructing confidence intervals. Um, so like this line of code is identical to what you would do if you were constructing a confidence interval. So here you're telling infer like, I'm interested in the relationship between gender and decision. And then the second parameter, we're just telling infer that like the success outcome here is that um, for decision is that you've been promoted um, as opposed to like not. So we have to tell infer like what is the, what's like the, the, the good outcome here. Um, and then like this, this is a new verb from infer for specifically for hypothesis testing. Um, and like, we're just telling it what the null, null hypothesis is in this case, like you can have different null hypotheses. And like in this case, the null hypothesis is that um, gender and decision are independent. Like they don't, there's no, there's no relationship between those variables. And so that's why we specify independence here. Um, then on this line, like this is similar to what we did for, for um, constructing confidence intervals. Um, there's the reps just specifies the number of times that we want to do this shuffling. Um, and you'll notice that instead of when we were doing confidence intervals for type, we specified bootstrap, which basically gets into this distinction between like resampling with replacement and without replacement. So for constructing confidence intervals, we were resampling with replacement and here we're resampling without replacement. So once we draw um, a gender from our uh, from our initial observation and basically reshuffle it like it's gone like we can't draw it again so we have to we're gonna get another one um, that's a little hand wavy but uh, hopefully that makes sense feel free to stop me if you're like that's a garbage explanation even if like you understand the material um, it's helpful for me uh, so whatever you no you explained it very well. Okay, um, and then this last step is, um, you know, we're, we're calculating basically the the uh, the statistic. Um, in this case, we're interested in the in it's called a difference in props. It's just difference in proportion of promotion rates. Um, and the order uh, parameter here says that like we're interested in the difference. Um, we're interested in subtracting the female proportions from the male proportions. So that's the order just tells us like the order of the subtraction there. Um, and so if we, if we take this null distribution and we, we visualize it, um, we're, we're going to wind up with this, this histogram. Um, it's a, it's a simulation that, that, um, basically tells us what the proportion of, uh, different difference in promote, um, uh, difference in proportion of promotion rates should be assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And, um, and then when we pass in this, there's this shade P value um, uh, geometry that we're adding to uh, ggplot here. And we're passing in the actual observed difference in proportions, which was like something like 20% or something like that. And um, we're also telling it like, okay, the, we only care about whether there's a bias on the right side of this, which, which, court, which translates to like, we only care if there's a bias against women in favor of men. So that's why we're specifying right here. Um, and so uh, this line um, is the, the observed um, difference in proportions. Um, and so you can see that it's like, it's uh it's pretty rare like it's in all of the um kind of simulated um difference in proportions when we did our shuffling like there's not very many that um that were this extreme and um i missed this the first time i um i looked at the graph but like there's this little shaded area to the right um that's that's kind of highlighted when you when you visualize this distribution and that just shows us the the number of times that um, that uh, this out this outcome or something more extreme was observed um, when we when we did this reshuffling um, so so let's see I don't know why looks like I might have accidentally oh okay yeah 
So at this point in the chapter, they just like contrast what we just did with constructing confidence intervals. So I'm just gonna fly through this really quickly. So like, cause it's pretty similar to what we saw. So again, you're specifying that if you wanted to construct a confidence interval here, you're just specifying like that you're interested in the relationship between gender and decision. And again, you're saying that the success outcome is promoted. Um, you're still using generate, but this time um, you're saying that the type is bootstrap instead of permute. Um, and this again is saying that I want to do resampling um, with replacement this time. Um, and with these two changes, what you wind up with is, uh, if you visualize it, you wind up with um, this, this confidence interval. And the thing that they really want to point out here is that um, when you have, when you do this hypothesis test and you reject the null hypothesis, the corresponding confidence interval um, is not going to contain zero for the sample statistic that you're, that you're calculating. So in other words, like the confidence interval is going to tell you that like, hey, it's unlikely that like the actual population, um, the, the, the difference in proportion for promotions in the actual population, it's unlikely that that's actually zero. Um, so there's like, it's kind of two sides of the same coin, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, wow, are we really 15 minutes in already? Time flies. Uh, okay, so there's some learning checks here. I think um, in the interest of time, like we should not do the first one, but um, maybe we can talk through the second and third one, or maybe just the second one. Um, so why are we relatively competent confident that the distributions of the sample proportions will be good approximations of the population distributions of promotion proportions for the two genders. So this is like kind of review, I think, from some other concepts, but um, do you have any ideas here? Let's load it up. So confident distributions of the sample proportions will be good approximations of the population distributions. Well, I think we're relatively confident of this because we've shuffled the um, gender and observed what the null distribution looked like. And well, does that even imply that we're confident, though? Yeah, I actually, don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't either. This is tough. I'm gonna um, just pull up the. I mean, there are answers for the um, learning checks. So let's see what they're looking for here, because like. I actually, the phrase um, population distributions, like it's not even clear. I don't know what that is. Like what's a population distribution? Um, yeah. Because so in the framework they've presented, the population was un, was what we wanted to understand and infer about and so we'd sample it. Yeah, let's, let's, let's see what they put here. Uh, solution because the sample is representative of the population. Okay, that's a little disappointing, um, but that's what they put. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> well, I think I think that goes back to like the randomness. Like, um, so the sample, the sample that's drawn from the population is random. Um, that's how. That's how, that's one way that we know that it's representative. That's like the main way I think. And then like the sample size is large, like. If it's random and large, then like we know that it's representative of the population. Oh, so this is more critiquing like the sampling process, like yeah, like so their their um, way they they chose to scoop balls out of the urn in this case to scoop uh, people out of the. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see, what, what is this third one? Using the definition of p-value, write in words that uh, what the p-value represents for the hypothesis test comparing the promotion rates for males and females. So I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Um, so the p-value in this case represents the probability that we would observe a difference in promo uh, pr pr promotion rates um, as extreme or more extreme than like 20% or whatever it was. Um, 20 percentage points rather. Um, that's how I would, that's how I would state it. 
Anything to add? No, I think, I mean, I think that's, yeah, that's effective. All right, let's see what the next thing is here. So now there's, uh, the next section is about like interpreting um, hypothesis tests. And um, they, they, they basically have this metaphor, they wanna use a legal metaphor for explaining like how we should interpret these things. And there's a quote that like I thought like nicely summarized their thoughts on this. Um, so they say, uh, while gut instinct may suggest uh, failing to reject the null hypothesis and accepting the null hypothesis are equivalent statements, they are not. Accepting the null hypothesis is equivalent to finding a defendant innocent. Um, however, courts do not find defendants innocent, but rather they find them not guilty. Putting things differently, defense attorneys do not need to prove that their clients are innocent. Rather, they only need to prove that their clients are not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So that's kind of the, the analogy they want to draw there. And they just want to make it clear that when we're not rejecting the null hypothesis, so if, if, if for example, we, um, we did not reject the hypothesis that there's no uh, discrimination uh, against women in the workplace in, in, in banks. If we didn't reject that hypothesis, it wouldn't be the same thing as saying, as accepting that there is no discrimination um, for, uh, against women in, in banks. Um, so I, that, that's kind of interesting. I think it's a, I think it's a good point. It's, it's kind of subtle, but, um, but yeah. So then um, after they make that point, they get into some um, some more definitions. Um, I always, always forget what, which one is type one and which one's type two. Uh, so little quiz um, for, uh, well, I'm cheating because I can see on my speaker notes the answer, but um, what, how do they define a type one error? Type one error is convicting someone that's innocent. So you've uh, rejected the null hypothesis. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So they say it's when you reject the null hypothesis when in fact it is true. Um, so yeah, uh, I have to like get that drilled in my head because it's, uh, I always, always forget it. I always have to look it up. On yeah, and that principle is like this framework is all over the place, not just in like inference, but also in like model comparisons. And mm -hmm. I want to really drill it in as well. Okay, now type two error. What's that? Failing to reject when in fact um, there was an effect to be to be identified, but you didn't identify. Yeah, it. yeah. Well, well said. Um, failing to reject an all hypothesis when in fact the null <clears throat> hypothesis is false. Um, okay, they they have some more terminology that they want us to learn. Um, which is the significance level or alpha? Um, what what's what does that mean? Significance level is so like there's, when you get your null distribution, you're looking at the percentile that your observed value falls in. So setting that threshold is like your benchmark. So um, five percent is common. You you want it to be in like the ninety fifth percentile or higher. Um, but that level, that benchmark, that that's like your KPI. And so you sure. set that. I like that. That's a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. They put it a little differently here. They said like, it's the probability of a type one error occurring. Um, so the probability, let's see if I can remember, we just went over it like five seconds ago. So it's the probability that you would reject the null hypothesis when you shouldn't have. Um, when, when the null hypothesis was actually true. Um, so that's the significance level. Um, but you're right, it is the benchmark and all that. That's actually like a more helpful way of putting it, but this is like kind of the, I don't know, it was like the closest thing to like the bolded part of the word that, which kind of suggested a definition. So, um, okay, let's look at some more learning checks. Um, we can skip nine five. I mean, I think we understand that pretty well. Uh, purpose of hypothesis testing. Uh, I think we understand that pretty well. Let's see. 
Okay, yeah. This is, what are some flaws with hypothesis testing and how could we alleviate them? Uh, I, mean, I don't have enough experience with it to speak to this personally, but one thing I hear is that um, using the null distribution as your benchmark is inadequate. It ought mm -hmm. it to be desired in terms of what, I don't know, but apparently um, there's, a, there's a big movement, like in Bayes, like there's a big movement away from comparing things to the null distribution, looking at um, different models. So you, mm -hmm. you create, you're not using the null hypothesis, you're using multiple competing hypotheses and you're able to, um, I guess it's a, a richer um, set of benchmarks that you're setting for yourself. There's more to be learned, there's more flexibility, but it's, but I don't, I don't have that, that's not like drilled into my soul because I don't have enough experience with hypothesis testing. What about yeah, you? that's, that's, that's really interesting. I, I mean, we've talked about this before about how like the Bayesian stuff is, is kind of, it's not really covered here and like, it's really interesting and it'd be good to get into. Um, I think I'm guessing that what they're looking for here has to do with like sample size again. So like they were, th there was a paragraph about how like, you can't reduce the probability of error to zero unless you like count every single person, which is like not really practical. Um, let's see if, let's see if that lines up with what we have. So that's nine, seven. Oh, that's interesting. So the p values, um, 0 0.05 threshold can be misleading researchers to conduct multiple bootstrap tests to get a smaller p-value, therefore validating their statistical results. Huh. That's interesting. I don't remember that being really covered in the chapter, but I don't know if you can see that, but. Yeah, I can see it. Awesome. Yeah. I'm just thinking about this now. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, there's some, there seems to be a a lever you can pull as a researcher to game it around and it's around how many bootstrap tests you run but i don't know what that would uh yeah i think there's definitely you can do some p hacking there's yeah that's, so there, there's some stuff in like uh, our data yeah. science about this where like you want to have like a holdout set that you for for your test so like you, you know, you only, you only run your, your hypothesis test on that like once or something, but that's, and that feels a little different than this. That's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, and I actually don't remember this being covered in the main text. Um, that's interesting. I guess we'll move on, but, um, okay, let's do this one. Um, let's do uh, nine, eight. So consider two, um, alpha significance levels of 0.1 and 0.01 of the two, which would lead to a more liberal hypothesis testing procedures. In other words, one that will, all things being equal, lead to more rejections of the null hypothesis. Well, the 0.1. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you've set a lower threshold there. Or a higher threshold or whatever. I don't know if you're right. Anyway, it's a bigger number. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the next part of the chapter, they basically do a case study about um, like whether action movies or whether romance movies are rated more highly than action movies um, based on data from IMDb. Um, so they do the same sort of thing that they did for the gender discrimination where they're like, look, you know, we can graph this out with a box plot and we see that there's a difference, but is that conclusive? 
um, enough to um, conclude that there's that there's a difference in the population. So um, basically, they say, look, your null hypothesis is that the difference between um, uh, so the mean rating for action movies, so that's mu uh, sub a, um, and then um, minus the the mean of ratings for romance movies, so that's mu sub r, is zero. So there is no difference. Um, that's your null hypothesis. And then your alternative hypothesis is that um, that there is a difference. And this is, I think the main reason they go through this example is they want to show like a two-sided test. Um, so, you know, the code for constructing this hypothesis test is going to be very similar. Um, like it's basically identical um, to what we saw before. The main difference is this, like when we shade the p-value, um, we're going to specify this direction both um, because it's a two-sided test. Um, and, um, so when we look at the, the, um, when we visualize the null distribution, uh, you know, again, we have our, our distribution, um, our, uh, of the sample statistic based on assuming the null hypothesis is true. We have our observed value, um, which is our red bar. And then like, you can barely see it, but like, there are these shaded regions that again, represent, um, you know, the, uh, these these areas that are um, uh, basically their their uh, their extreme values. Um, so so yeah, that's that's the two sided test basically. I mean, the rest of it is like they cover kind of more in detail, but it's pretty much the same as what we saw for the gender discrimination stuff. Um, now. They get into theory-based hypothesis testing, um, and they stick with the example of IMDb, um, and they kind of give you um, some steps to, uh, to to go through in order to, to use the theory-based method. The first thing that you, you have to do is you have to standardize your variables, um, and they, they have a little passage about this, and they say basically, a common task in statistics is the process of standardizing a variable, um, by standardizing different variables, we make them more comparable. Um, they give a helpful example here. They say, look, like, let's say you're, you have a data set that has temperatures in like Portland, Oregon, and Quebec. Um, Portland, Oregon temperatures are going to be in Fahrenheit. Um, Quebec temperatures are going to be in uh, Celsius. So like you can convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, or you could just convert them to like uh, a common uh, 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 kind of way of measuring and uh, uh, common like unit of measurement. And the common unit of measurement that we like for um, hypothesis testing for using theory-based methods is something called a z-score. Um, do you happen to know what the z-score is offhand? Yeah, you subtract the mean and then divide by the standard deviation, I think. Yeah, that's it. Awesome. Um, and the interpretation of uh, the z-score is um, basically how many standard units you are away from uh, the away that value is from the mean. So you take a temperature, you do this transformation on it, and then you're wound you wind up with how many standard units away that value is from the mean. Um, and the reason that this z-score matters is it figures into this. Um, um, uh, this is kind of a bad slide because it's got a lot going on, but like, just pay attention to the dotted line for now. Um, so the z-score, um, the z-scores for for your for your data should follow this like this the z distribution, um, and uh, yeah, we'll come back to the slide in a second. So then they. They, they make the statement, there's kind of this theoretical um, result in math um, that's similar to the central limit theorem. And they say, um, sample means, uh, or sorry, it can be mathematically proven that the two sample T statistic follows a T distribution with degrees of freedom roughly equal to, um, here's like, NA means like the number of action movies plus the number of romance movies minus two. And so going back to this slide, like we see that these, these T distributions are similar to the, uh, the Z distribution. And 
that the more degrees of freedom we have, basically the larger the sample, the closer that the T distribution is going to approximate um, the Z distribution. And so we can basically use this kind of mathematical um, theory to construct a null distribution. Um, so instead of doing simulations with shuffling, um, we can just use this fact. We know that T distributions are look like this. They look like this. They, they have this shape. Um, and so once, once we know that, we can construct the null distribution. And the code for that is similar to what we had for constructing the null distribution when we were using um, this, the, the, the simulated method, the, the permutation method. Um, the key difference is that when we call calculate for, um, for kind of calculating the, uh, the sample statistic, um, the, the statistic that we're interested in here is T instead of like difference in proportions or whatever. Um, and again, you know, um, yeah, that's actually, that's it. So, um, so when we, when we uh, use this infer code, we wind up with a, um, a, a null distribution that looks kind of like our, our simulated um, null distribution. Um, although like the theoretical one is smoother, right? There's not like this kind of binning that happens, like it's, it's a true kind of curve. Um, and um, that's interesting. I don't know why that's my next slide, but um, okay. So that's, that's how we calculate the null distribution kind of using, taking advantage of this theoretical method. Now, once we've done that, um, we can calculate the actual T statistic for the data that we've observed. And in order to do that, um, we basically just have to follow this formula. Um, and so this is the way to read this is it's the sample mean uh, uh, rating of action movies minus the sample um, rating of romance movies minus, and then here you have um, basically the same thing, but with populations instead of samples. Um, and you divide that by the standard error of uh, the mean, uh, uh, the, the sample mean uh, rating of action movies minus the sample mean rating of um, romance movies. Now, because we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true, we can basically ignore this part of the formula, right? Because the null hypothesis says that the population, the difference in the population means is zero. So this, this right, this, this um, right side of the subtraction here in the numerator is just going to be zero um, if we're assuming that the null hypothesis is true. So we can say, forget that. And then um, the standard error, this, this denominator thing, it simplifies or depending on your perspective, gets more complicated uh, <laughs> yeah. to this, this, uh, this square root term here in the denominator. So um, we can use R to calculate these things. And I didn't include the code, but like it's pretty easy to like calculate the means and all these things and divide them up and et cetera. And um, once you have that, you basically wind up with um, the, um, well, you wind up with, with this. So um, you wind up with your observed kind of T statistic. Um, this, this corresponds to, you know, before we had our observed difference in means, uh, I'm sorry, our observed difference in proportions going back to the um, discrimination case. And we said, okay, that observed difference in proportions is surprising because if we look at the null distribution for what we should be getting here, um, it should be you know, closer to zero. And it's the same thing is true here for this T statistic. So we've calculated the actual observed T statistic based on our data. And when we you know, throw that onto this plot of the null distribution, um, the, the, the theoretically constructed null distribution, we see that, okay, like this is surprising. Like it's, you know, it's an outlier. Um, or it looks like an outlier, or it looks um, unlikely. And so, yeah, that, and, and like the rest, like as far as like, you know, calc like you can get the p-value for this thing by calling an infer function that calculates the p-value given the, um, the actual observed t-statistic. And that's all like pretty much the same as 
um, what we saw for um, the simulation based method of hypothesis testing. So, um, so yeah, moving on to, um, there are some conditions that kind of have to be uh, respected when uh, you're using this theory based um, hypothesis testing and the conditions are basically you, you need nearly normal populations um, or large sample sizes. Um, so large being like you're usually fine if your sample size is greater than 30. Now the samples need to be selected independently of each other and um, the observations are independent from each other. And they, they go into detail, I think, about like what these mean and why they could be problems, I think, later on in the chapter. Maybe I'm actually might be getting confused with the other book, but um, but yeah, that's those are the conditions for theory-based hypothesis testing. And that is all I have. That was very nice. Thank you, sir. Very interesting. Should I stop recording or? Yeah, feel free. All right, I'm going to stop recording.